Welcome to class 14 in the series, The Final Prophecy. Sometimes the best way to understand prophecy is simply to read other prophecy. Today's class begins to unravel Jesus' prophetic messages in Matthew, Mark, and Luke in just that manner. We're going to examine clues to those prophecies first found elsewhere in other scripture. A detailed study guide at RestoredGospel.com with notes and descriptions about all these prophecies exists for your use. The book is a free download or you can use the online study guide. We hope you will enjoy the next hour as we open God's Word and ask Him to know if these words are true. If you'd like to learn more about the Book of Mormon or have your own copy, links at the end of the video provide useful information. And now, class 14 in the series, The Final Prophecy. We are back. Thank you all. Uh, last week, we had some game show contestants here, and you guys did really well, but no one won the million dollar prize. And if you remember what that question was, uh, you had to be here to, to know the inside joke. But uh, we talked about this time when Zion is, Jesus is in the midst, and something really important happens. And, and uh, the Jeopardy contestants all kind of hemmed and hawed, and then we revealed Isaiah says, in that day, in that day is the second time, the second time when the Lord sets forth his hand to do what? To recover the lost and fallen. So this class is going to build on that a little bit. And um, Rogers encouraged me by a couple questions to look at Matthew 24. We're going to spend some time in Matthew 24. But before we get there, I got a question for you. Now, we had game show last week. We're back to math class, unfortunately, now. A equals B plus C. Does anyone know what A equals in the class? Anyone? A equals B plus C, right. Does anyone know what B plus C equals? A. A, yeah. So what is A and what is B and what is C? You could actually have an infinite combination of results. You, you could do that. You know, you could say, well, we'll get into this. So, but if I learned anything in college math, uh, I learned one thing that I retain. What, you got a question? Well, I would say B's not A and C's not A, but if you add them both together, they equal A. Exactly, exactly. That is the point, is that there is something in mathematics called the power of substitution. You could put A into an equation like this, 15 equals four times A plus nine divided by eight. Does anyone know what A is just off the top of your head? No, of course you don't. But if I gave you some time to think about it, you could. But if A equals B plus C, notice what you can do with the equation. You can also say 15 equals, notice where A was, now it's B plus C. A equals B, or four times that. Say you plug some numbers in, and I'm going through this kind of quick because I want to make a simple point. It's not, not real deep, but it is. If you say, okay, one of the combinations could be three equals two plus one, A equals B plus C, right? A is three, B is two, C is one. Then you could write it this way, and the equation is gonna be true. Put A in there, which is three, 15 is four times three, that's 12, plus nine divided by three, three more, 15, right? Or you could say 15 equals four times the quantity two plus one, which is three, plus nine divided by quantity two plus one, which is three. Same result. What is the point of this? A is re explained by a relationship between B and C. That's the power of substitution in math. So what does this have to do with class? And what does this have to do with Matthew 24? Here's the point. Prophecy can be understood in the same relationship, in that prophecy, if you want to understand prophecy, you know the best way to understand prophecy is? Read other prophecy, okay? Now that sounds kind of redundant to say that, but if you want to understand prophecy, read prophecy. But here's the point. At this juncture in the world's history, we don't have any single chapter in any book of Scripture. We, we don't have any entire book of Scripture in all the books of Scripture we have that explains all the prophecy in one place at one time. Right? So prophecy comes to us in pieces. Prophecy is something that the Lord gives here and there a little bit at time to fit his purposes and to explain. I've lamented that this is our 14th class together since February. You know, we've missed a few Sundays, but I can't think of a class where we've ever really been able to put our arms around everything at once. We've just taken pieces of this at a time because there's a lot to it. But the point is, 
sometimes if you have a question like what is A, and you know what A equals B plus C, as Roger pointed out, maybe by studying B plus C you can understand A. All right, and that's, that's the point of this. So I think you'll see as we go. Last week, we talked about this second time, and the Lord's going to set his hand again a second time to restore his people from their lost and fallen state. Now, we haven't really defined what the first time was. I don't want to talk about that just now. Let's, let's just assume that what's happening in the future or right now is a time when the Lord's going to do something mighty, and it's all explained in the covenants and in the prophecies. There's going to be a time, as if you look at the bottom scripture up here in Jacob, the Lord's going to recover his people. It'll be the last time. It'll be a time when servants go forth in his power to nourish and prune the vineyard, which the vineyard being the world, nourishing and pruning would be to nourish, feeds it, prunes, cuts out dead stuff, to do both through the word of God, and to bring good, to remove evil, okay, before the end comes, all right? So, that's what's understand this second time is. But let's go over to this scripture we talked about, Matthew 24. And this is, this is really, really good that you brought this up, uh, Roger, a couple times in questions. And we'll have time to dialogue about this because I don't really have, I don't have Matthew 24 in your notes as far as the, the book that you have. It's, there's allusions to it, but this could be a good study in itself because if you see where I'm going with this, A equals B plus C, we can get some understanding of Matthew 24 by looking at other prophecy, all right? What I'd like to do is for a few minutes, I think it's worth doing this, we're going to read the main portion of Matthew 24 in case, you know, some people, it's like a certain scripture. You can say, well, Genesis 9, 21, and most people think, oh yeah, everlasting covenant. You know, there's certain scriptures, John 3, 16, they bring to mind a passage, and Matthew 24 may or may not do that for you. But if you have your Bibles, and you can read this pretty much in, in any version, although the wording is slightly different, in, in the inspired version. I'm going to share the context, I don't know, the, the meat of Matthew 24. We'll read it through together, and then I want to go back through and look at some of the themes. So in your Bible, Matthew 24, verse 4. So Jesus, to put this in context, has spent a lot of time explaining things to the disciples, and he, he leaves the temple, and he says some things profound, and he says to the people, hey, by the way, this temple, is there's not going to be one stone left upon another. And the people, probably their jaws dropped, and they're like, what is the deal? And so Jesus departs, and he goes up to the mountain, Mount of Olives, and his disciples are following him, like, what is Jesus talking about? And so they kind of push him on this, and they say, here we are at Mount of Olives, verse 4. As he sat upon the Mount of, Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be which thou hast said concerning the destruction of the temple and the Jews? So he's talked about two things, destruction of temple and Jews. And what's the sign of thy coming and the end of the world, or the destruction of the wicked, which is the end of the world? So he, he, they're asking a lot of stuff. They're asking big, meaty questions. Jesus says, now he starts the explanation. And, and notice he can't answer any of this in a single sentence. So let's read it through and then we'll, we'll come back. Jesus said unto them, take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and also betray one another and shall hate one another. Many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that remaineth steadfast and is not overcome, the same shall be saved. When ye therefore see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet concerning the destruction of Jerusalem, then ye shall stand in the holy place. And then it says in parentheses, whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them who are in Judea flee unto the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop flee and not return to take anything out of his house. Neither let him who is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child and on them who give suck in those days. Therefore pray ye the Lord that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath. For then in those days shall be great tribulations on the Jews and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, such as was not before sent upon Israel of God since the beginning of their kingdom until this time. No, nor ever shall be sent again upon Israel. 
And all things which have befallen them are only the beginning of the sorrows which shall come upon them. And except those days shall be shortened, there shall none of their flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, according to the covenant, those days shall be shortened. Behold, these things have I spoken unto you concerning the Jews. And again, after the tribulation of those days, which shall come upon Jerusalem, if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe him not. For in those days there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that, if possible, they shall deceive the very elect, who are the elect according to the covenant. Behold, I speak these things unto you for the elect's sake. And ye also shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see that ye be not troubled, for all I have told you must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Behold, I have told you before, wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the light of the morning cometh out of the east, and shineth even unto the west, and covereth the whole earth, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And now I show unto you a parable. Behold, wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered. So likewise shall mine elect be gathered from the four quarters of the earth. And they shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. Behold, I speak unto you for mine elect's sake. For nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famine and pestilence and earthquakes in divers places. And again, because iniquity shall abound, the love of men shall wax cold. But he that shall not be overcome, the same shall be saved. And again, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come or the destruction of the wicked. And again, shall the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet be fulfilled. And immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun shall be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Verily I say unto you, this generation in which these things shall be shown forth shall not pass away until all I have told you shall be fulfilled. Although the days come that heaven and earth shall pass away, yet my word shall not pass away, but all be fulfilled. And as I said before, after the tribulation of those days, and the powers of heaven shall be shaken, then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. They shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And whoso treasureth up my word shall not be deceived. For the Son of Man shall come, he shall send his angels before him with the great sound of a trumpet. They shall gather together the remainder of his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Now learn a parable of the fig tree when its branches are tender and it begins to put forth leaves. You know that summer's nigh at hand. So likewise, my elect, when they shall see these things, they shall know that he is near even at the doors. But of that day and hour, no one knoweth, nor the angels of God in heaven, but my father only. And so as it was in the days of Noah, shall it be also at the coming of the Son of Man. For it shall be with them as it was in the days which were before the flood, until the day Noah entered the ark. They were eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, and knew not till the flood came and took them all away. So also shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall be fulfilled that which is written, that in the last days two shall be in the field, one shall be taken, and the other left. Two shall be grinding in the mill, the one taken, the other left. And what I say unto one, I say unto all, watch, therefore, for you know not at what hour the Lord doth come. There, Matthew 24. Everyone got it, right? <laughs> All right, there's, there's a lot there, no doubt. What is it telling us about? Just anybody, kind of in general, any? If you could summarize Matthew 24 in a sentence or so, or even a statement, any, any thoughts? I always thought it was in two parts. Okay. Matthew 21 was talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. Right. Our side of that, uh, right. Okay. Good thoughts. Anybody else? Well, and I'm sure you have some thoughts. Maybe no one wants to say because you're thinking, I don't want to be embarrassed and say something, and he's going to contradict me. But I'm I'm not here to do that, and I'm not uh, here to uh, change anyone's mind about anything. But let me let me summarize by a. But hopefully the scriptures can all point us in the same direction. Let me pull a few things out by bullet points that we just read about. So just as a summary, and these are just my own words, we heard about, as a brother said, the destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, there was a phrase in there used a few times called the elect. Anyone catch that? Yeah. Uh, Jesus talks about his return. 
It talks about tribulation, it says there will be tribulation greater than anything has ever happened and, and nothing like it again. It talks about this thing, this abomination of what? Desolation, something about Daniel. Okay, that's thrown in there. Uh, if that tribulation hadn't stopped, it would lead to their maybe utter destruction. Wars, rumors of wars, you hear those statements, those words used from time to time. What does that mean? And then a gathering, not only just a gathering, but a gather, gathering from the four quarters of the earth. It even says from the ends of heaven. And uh, even the gospel being preached in all the earth. Signs in the sun and moon. Did you catch that? You know, the, the sun will be darkened, the moon not give its light. And even the phrase, and even the powers of heaven shaken. Hmm. That's, that's an interesting one. And then finally, a marvelous gathering where one is at, two are working at the mill, one is taken. Two are in, at home, one is taken. Something that the world has is, is never seen, but gathering to what and, and by whom and when. There's probably some other elements in this we could pick up, but there's a lot there, right? There's a lot there. Yeah, Roger, go ahead. One thing that, uh, verse that stays out with me, with me is the destruction of the wicked. Uh-huh. And... When you look at what Israel's been through from the beginning of their time till now, I don't see the destruction of the wicked. Okay, okay. Do you have any thoughts on that that you'd like to add? No. Okay. Well, tell you what. The point of this class is, what do we say? Um, well, we're going to remember A equals B plus C. All of these parts of Matthew... Each of these little bullet points I have up here, you could consider that's the A part of the equation. And if we want to understand what A is, we have to understand what B and C is, right? Or R. So this is a good point to start. The destruction of the wicked. There are multiple scriptures that help us understand that. Let's turn to one right now, Matthew 21. And God tells us that if you seek, you will find. If you ask, he will answer. If you diligently seek, he will, he will be diligent to answer. There's reasons probably why some of the prophecies are a little bit shrouded in mystery, and that's because he wants us to seek and wants us to understand. At times, he spoke in parables, and at times, he explained the parables, and at times, parables were given without explanation, stating sometimes others would explain. An example... Nephi is writing about end times and he stops and, and says, I'm not going to finish because there's a guy coming named John and he's going to write about the end times. And, and John writes in, in prophecy with parables and symbols in Revelation. That's what Nephi was talking about. But Nephi says, but those explanations won't come until the end when the Jews return to Jesus. So there's, there's complexity for reasons only God knows. There's, we don't always understand but I will say this, and, and if, if any of the classes leading up today have shown one thing, and, and this has really been a revelation to me in just the last few years of my life, this book, this record given to us by the remnant of Joseph, their writings, contains so much explanation of prophecy that it's the answer sometimes to the A equals B plus C. If you want to find B plus C, you can find a lot of it in the Book of Mormon. And you'll find that these prophets were all inspired by the same God with the same message. And one person tells a little bit of it here and someone else explains more of it somewhere else. We're going to find a lot of the explanations for Matthew 24 and other scriptures like it come from the Book of Mormon. When I say other scriptures like it, uh, you'll find Matthew 24 and Mark 13 are almost word for word identical. Luke 21 tells the same message, but what's interesting is what Luke 21 adds, the other two Gospels don't share. We'll get into this. But let's turn, if you will, to Matthew 21. And I'm, I want, I'm going to take a couple weeks with this. I'm not going to try to hurry through this too quickly. And part of my reason for saying that is I've spent time and I want to spend more time trying to make this presentable through some slides. You can sometimes spend too much time trying to make a presentation. And I, I don't want to do that, but I think in the purpose of a presentation for this, it can help make some of the explanations clear. But Roger asked, you know, hey, what about the destruction of the wicked? Well, let's, let's look at a couple things of this, all right? So Matthew 21, Matthew 21 is actually the first discourse and, and Matthew 22 and 23 are continued Jesus sharing until he finally gets to Matthew 24 when he's talked about all these elements that we've talked about in certain places. And then the disciples finally say, time out. We need some help understanding this. So 
we're going to back up to some of the first words Jesus shared. And so if you look at Matthew 21, Jesus is being challenged by Pharisees and they're asking questions of him. They, they want to know by which power, who gave him the authority to say the things he's saying. And so he stumps them by asking a question, and I'm summarizing right now the context up through about verse 26 or so. He stumps them because he said, okay, well, I'll answer your question where I got my authority if you'll answer this question. Where did John get the authority? And we're talking about John the Baptist. Well, John was beheaded, as you know, unfortunately. When they get asked with that question, they're, they're shocked because they don't know how to answer because they're in a quandary. They reason among themselves, well, if we say that John was a prophet, then he's going to say, well, if he was a prophet and he got his authority from heaven like prophets do, why didn't you listen to him? So they're like, oh, we can't uh, say that because then we'll look like hypocrites. So then they say, well, if we say that John got his authority from the people, well, we can't do that because then the people all think he was a prophet of God and they'll stone us for that. So they're, they're caught literally between a rock and a hard spot. They don't want to get stoned and they don't want to give an answer. So they shrug their shoulders and say, we don't know where John got his authority. Yeah, they, they kind of slip out of it. So Jesus says, okay, well, I'm not going to tell you either. So that's how it happens. But then he tells them this. He, he asked them a question. He said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you how this is going to play out. So starting at verse 25, this is Matthew chapter 21, verse 25. I'm reading from the inspired version. Uh, Neither tell you I, by what authority I do these things. So that's what Jesus says. Now he says, but what do you think? A man had two sons. They came to the field saying, son, uh, go to, to work today in my vineyard. And the first said, I will not. But afterwards, the first son repented and he went to work. Okay. And then he came to the second son and said, likewise. And the second son answered and said, I will serve. But that son doesn't. So then Jesus turns to them and says in verse 29, so which of these two did the will of the father? And the crowd answers, well, the first, the one who says, I'm not going to serve, but then actually does what the father wants. So then Jesus explains, he says, verily I say unto you that the publicans and the harlots shall go into the kingdom of God before you. What were the publicans? Is that like Republicans? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> hey, no. Uh, yeah, you think so? No, uh, it's, it's where we get the word pub. They were the bar owners, okay? They were, these guys ran the taverns, okay? And you can imagine maybe what, what kind of crowd hung out in the taverns. But he couples them with the harlots. He's saying, see, the, the publicans and the bar owners are going to go into the kingdom of God before you. What's he saying? He said, these, these are the ones who said, no, we don't want any part of you, Jesus. We just want to live it up here in this world, kind of find the ways of the flesh to be more pleasurable. But all of a sudden, the power of Jesus comes in their life, and they have a change of heart. And then these people who are wicked and evil, all of a sudden, no, we want to follow, right? And so they're the ones who are like the first son, okay? And he's comparing them, and, and he's, he's kind of slamming these Pharisees, not kind of, he is, because he's saying, these are the ones who are so evil and corrupt in your eyes, but they turned and they served me, right? They're going to enter the kingdom because their hearts changed. He said, you guys are like the second son. You're the ones who said, hey, we're going to serve, we're going to do all this. And then they just glory in their own righteousness, right? And their hearts never change. They, they never come to know Jesus. And so this becomes the point of his message. But he explains this in a prophetic fashion now. So he says, John, and this is verse 32, John came unto you in the way of righteousness and bore record of me, and you believed him not. But the publicans and harlots believed him. See, these people who you cast off, they saw John baptizing and they went in the desert and they were baptized, they were changed. You know, we have the woman who's found at Jesus' feet, wiping his feet with her tears and, and the Pharisees like saying, hey, if this guy was a prophet and just knew who this woman was, was he in touching him he he wouldn't let her even do that to him so he can't be a prophet and yet Jesus says wherever the gospel's told you're going to tell not the story of you the Pharisee but you this woman right because that's the change of heart that's what matters in life right this is why the book of Mormon teaches so clearly hey unless your heart has changed you don't enter the kingdom of heaven right it's not so much about your past it's about your change so he explains this, that John baptized these publicans and harlots, and they believed him. But afterwards, he said, when you had seen me, you didn't repent, and, and you didn't believe him either. So verse 33, so he that believed not John concerning me 
uh, cannot believe me except he first repent. And except you repent, the preaching of John shall condemn you in the day of judgment. And here again, another parable that I speak unto you, for your unrighteousness may be rewarded unto you. So the next parable he speaks is in verses 35 through about 44. They talk about a man who built a vineyard and he left to let servants take care of the vineyard. And the servants who were taking care of the vineyard, they got slothful, and then the others got sent, and they beat up these guys. And in the end, the, the heir is there, and they want to kill the heir, and they want to ruin the vineyard. And it's kind of an ugly ending to a story. But when Jesus concludes this, he explains, he says, Jesus said unto them, when the Lord therefore of the vineyard come, what will he do to these husbandmen? When the Lord comes back and finds out that these people killed his own son, and they corrupted the vineyard, what do you think the owner's going to do to these people who he trusted? Well, he says this, verse 43, this is Matthew 21, verse 43. They say unto him, he will destroy those miserable wicked men and let out the vineyard again unto other husbandmen who shall render him fruits in their season. So he's saying, not only are they fired, he says he's going he's gonna to kill them. He's going to destroy them and he's going to get someone who can do the job, who will do the job for him. So then Jesus asks a question. Did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected, the same as become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and shall be given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. So all of a sudden, once again to these Pharisees, he's saying something. He said, you are like these first servants who are supposed to keep track of the vineyard. And not only did you ruin it, but you killed my son in the process. And then Jesus continues, so God's going to get other people to do this. And I'm leading up to this destruction of the wicked. It comes in a few parts, but this is, this is one of the A, this equation A equals B plus C plus D plus E. There's a few parts to it to understand. So the kingdom of God is taken from them and given to another nation that will bear fruit. So in verse 46, for whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. And when the chief priests and Pharisees had heard his parables, they perceived that he spake of them. So he's like, he's talking about us. And they said among themselves, shall this man think that he alone can spoil this great kingdom? And they were angry with him. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitude because they learned that the multitude took him for a prophet. And now his disciples came to him and Jesus said unto them, marvel ye at the words of the parable, which I spake unto them. So this all happened with the Pharisees, but the Pharisees let them go. They were angry. They were upset. They wanted to take them away and do things Pharisees did to people they didn't agree with. But now he's with his disciples and he's asking them what they thought. And this is the explanation now. And this is kind of the first part of the answer to the equation. Jesus now says to the disciples this. Verse 51, Jesus says, Verily I say unto you, I am the stone, and those wicked men reject me. I am the head of the corner. These Jews shall fall upon me and shall be broken. And the kingdom of God shall be taken from them and shall be given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof, meaning the Gentiles. So right there, Jesus is telling them, hey, you are the nation, the Hebrews, the Jews. I came to you. I came to bring my gospel. I gave you every symbol of the gospel. And yet you didn't understand it. And then you kill me. I'm the stone. And then what does he say? But the gospel is going to be given to another nation the nation of the Gentiles. Now that really had to rub them because you couldn't be part of the kingdom unless you were born into the lineage back in those days, right? So now he's explaining to the Gen that the Gentiles are going to have righteous things happen. They're going to be the servants who come into the vineyard and take over. Well, so we can puff up our chests a little bit now because we're kind of that nation of the Gentiles. Remember, we've read all that through the Book of Mormon. The Gentiles come upon this nation. The, the gospel's restored to them. And not just in our day. That's what happens at the day of Pentecost. When the disciples even marvel, they say, hey, the, the spirit didn't just fall upon us Jews. It came upon us Gentiles too. Hey, do we need to baptize these guys? Yeah, yeah. This is why Peter has this vision. Hey, arise and kill and eat. And Peter's saying, no, I can't partake of that food. That's not, that's off limits according to our law. Jesus showed him a, a vision of food, which was symbolic of Gentiles. He said, no, this means you need to go minister to the Gentiles. They're part of this covenant too. So we see in the days of Jesus, the gospel is given to the Gentiles. All right. 
We see in, in the latter days, the gospel comes back to the Gentiles. That's us, right? We're not the Jews. We share, our, we're numbered among the remnant uh, we're in, of the blessing, but we're not them by lineage, okay? But notice what happens, and this is how Matthew 21 finishes. So he says, the gospel is taken from the Jews, given to a nation who will bring forth the fruits, meaning the Gentiles. And he says again, on whomsoever the stone shall fall, it will grind them to powder. But notice verse 55 and 56. And here's, as Shakespeare would say, here's the rub. Notice what this says, and this reads in anyone's Bible, I think it's the same. But when the Lord thereof of the vineyard cometh, he will destroy those miserable wicked men and let again his vineyard unto other husbandmen. So when he told the parable, he told about, hey, wicked servants who were replaced by good ones. They killed the son. But now he's adding to it and he's saying, no, but when those people become wicked, guess what? He says, in the last days when I come, even in the last days, I'm going to let again the vineyard unto other husbandmen in the last days who shall render him the fruits of their seasons. And this is how you know. He says in verse 56, Then understood they the parable which he spake unto them, that the Gentiles should also be destroyed when the Lord should descend out of heaven to reign in his vineyard, which is the earth and the inhabitants thereof. Isn't that kind of weird? So it starts with the Jews. He tells the Pharisees, well, the Jews, you guys reject me, so you're getting replaced by the Gentiles. And then secretly with the disciples, he explains more. And he says, and then the Gentiles, they have their problems too. See, that's everything Nephi has been telling us. That's everything Jesus told us. He said, this gospel is going to come to the Gentiles and from the Gentiles back to you. And when the Gentiles sin and reject the gospel, 3 Nephi 7, What? I bring my gospel back from among them and back to you, O house of Israel. See, the ones who finally render the fruits in their season are the remnant of the house of Israel, the ones to whom this gospel is supposed to return. And that's, that's how the story comes full circle. So first we've got a destruction of the wicked who are the Jews in Jesus' day, but a remnant survives, of course. Then we've got these Gentiles who were given the fullness of the gospel and maybe you think the story is about them and don't actually carry out the mission to restore Israel through this book that he gave us. And the nations of the Gentiles, as Nephi writes, are drunken with iniquity, just like the nations of the Jews. So we get the end of 3 Nephi 9, which we've read multiple times, where he says to the Gentile nations, I'm going to remove your chariots, your soothsayers. I'm going to remove all the immorality. And for what reason? Because I'm going to build a city in the land that you Gentiles inhabited, which was the land of Joseph. And from there will be the fruit that starts to bear forth again, right? And from there begins the second time that the Lord sets forth his hand in power, right? Now, getting the Book of Mormon, a lot of people would always say, well, that second time, that's exactly when Joseph Smith was given the Book of Mormon. Well, that began it, of course. But what Jesus teaches about the power of the day to come, when the power is there because he is present with us, that is what he calls the second time. That's why Isaiah 11, which we read, the first five verses, remember of Isaiah 11, talks about Jesus. The second five verses of Isaiah 11 talk about the wolf dwelling with the lamb in Zion. And then the 11th verse of Isaiah 11 says, and in that day he shall set forth his hand a second time to recover. So I've been talking for a little bit. Any thoughts or comments so far? Yes, sir. So that day in which all this is going to happen, the people on the earth are going to be like in the days of Noah. Right. And so, like I said, this is A equals B plus C plus D. Okay. So we haven't gotten to that part yet, the days of Noah. But I don't mean to cut you off. Keep going. What were you going to say? Well, I just haven't gotten there yet. And then in Second Nephi, it talks about Zion and what goes on in Zion. And you have the fall of the great and abominable church. Correct. Which uh, I believe are all churches, those churches which are built up by man and not of God. And uh, you could say through the dark ages, the Catholic church could be uh, the great and abominable church. But I think it has way more to do with that. I think it has to do with all churches. Yes, in 1 Nephi 3 and 1 Nephi 7, which are scriptures we're going to get to, discuss that. And I'm, that's actually part of where we're going. So I won't leave you hanging on that. Any other thoughts, comments? So part of what Jesus talked about, remember, 
taking it in context, Jesus had just finished this, what we call Matthew 21, this conversation. And, and, you know, I would imagine in the days, because all the Jews ever knew of Gentiles is that they hate us. They want our land. They want our houses. They want to destroy us. We're always protecting ourselves from the Gentiles. In fact, I forgot to put it in the notes, but I, I looked up Jerusalem in the history of Jerusalem. I don't know of any other city that's ever been under attack more than this. It was in the, in the biblical account attacked over 52 times. There's 52 times when there was enemies coming toward them. I mean, can you imagine if that was Lee Summit or something? 52 times. It was besieged 45 times, which means where they would just camp around and try to cut off your supplies so you're starving out. It was destroyed twice. It had, you know, the people carried off captive, prisoners, all these things. One little town, one little town is like, you know, Satan's relentless. That's, that's part of this story. But it's because the prophecies of all this stuff have a lot to do with the people of that place and the very place itself. So part of this destruction of Jerusalem, now part of it has to do with what we see with the Gentiles. Now I, I need you to turn ahead to Luke 17 and... Where I'm going with this is just to tie in a few more scriptures. Matthew 24, Mark 13. No, I'm sorry, I said Luke 17. Luke, Luke 21 first. I want Luke 21 first. Matthew 24 and Mark 13 both talk about destruction of the wicked, but they never talk about this other phrase, which the parallel to these is Luke 21. Luke adds something to this, and he says this, jumping ahead to verse 32, uh, Luke 21, verse 32. Verily I say unto you that this generation, when the times of the Gentiles shall be fulfilled, shall not pass away till all be fulfilled. See, Luke adds this description of the times of the Gentiles, and he repeats it again later. Verse 25, rather. I, I read the second one. The first one is Luke chapter 21, verse 25. And he says, In the generation in which the times of the Gentiles Gentiles shall be fulfilled. There will be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars, and the earth shall be in distress. And so Luke explains when you see the sign in the sun and the moon and the stars, that's the, when the times of the Gentiles are be fulfilled or in that era, in that generation. But that's a clue that Matthew and Mark don't record. When you read Matthew's account, he says, well, there's going to be signs in the sun and the stars and the moon when the destruction of the wicked comes. And so Luke couples this with this time of the Gentiles ending. So part of this is that Jesus was foretelling that there would be judgment on the Gentiles. All right, that's part of it. But that's not all of it. And that's not just saying, okay, our, our nation, our people. There's a difference in, it's sort of metaphorical, but part of our lineage and part of our understanding is that we believe we're part of the covenant no matter who our parents were. In other words, what our lineage was. We're part of the covenant. Matthew talks about the elect, right? He talks about the elect according to the covenant. If you were of the covenant, you were considered Israel. And we consider that in a spiritual sense right now. But lineage still matters. If you weren't part of the covenant, you were just considered a Gentile. Part of this prophecy, and this is where it becomes, I think, the understanding is on two levels, is really speaking about literal Jews and literal Gentiles. Part of the covenant, though, is speaking about metaphorical Jews, that is, house of Israel or people of the covenant who've made a covenant through baptism, their hearts are changed, versus people who haven't. And so your point, Roger, a good one, on the fact that there's this great and abominable church, and it talks about a time when there's two churches in the end. Well, if there's two churches in the end, we always want to side, don't we, with the good people? We, we figure, well, we're in the good church, right? Well, what does the good church mean? Does it mean, does it mean you were a Jew? I mean, by lineage, does it mean, you know, you were of some other tribe? No. Does it mean what? It means exactly what Nephi wrote. It says, whoever repents is, uh, has a covenant with Jesus. Whatever Jew doesn't repent doesn't have a covenant with Jesus. That's what it comes down to. So the one church are those people who've made a covenant with Jesus and their hearts are changed. The other, co- the other church is the rest of the world. And that's what it means, whoever fights against Zion, right? So in 1 Nephi 3, this is one of the places where it talks about this great and abominable church. So just to let you know where I'm going. So we talked about the fact that part of this was Gentiles specifically, but part of it now is just whoever doesn't make a covenant. And that's what Nephi is talking about. So the destruction of the wicked. Who are the wicked? Part of them were Jews and Gentiles, right? Jesus destroyed them both, right? But now, if you go to 1 Nephi 3, and we touched on this last week, 1 Nephi 3, verse 220. 1 Nephi 3, he sees a time in the end. And there's some powerful understanding 
to come up right in this verse to coordinate it with other verses. Remember, our quest right now is to understand A equals B plus C. We're trying to understand the prophecy of Matthew, how it's explained by other prophecy. And this is going to do part of this right here. So starting at verse 220, 1 Nephi 3, 220. And he saith unto me, behold, there are save it be two churches. Nephi sees this in vision. The one is the church of the Lamb of God. The other is the church of the devil. How much clearer picture could you have? I mean, it's on one hand or it's on the other, as always. So God's church are those who have repented, come unto him in covenant. Their hearts are changed. That's how you'd summarize it. And I'm not saying we, we want to break it down. Well, if you go to Colburn Road, but don't go to outreach, you know. Blah, blah. No, it's, this is what it means. All right. So this is, I'm, I'm kidding on that if, I, if it wasn't obvious. Sort of. <laughs> so the one is the one church of the Lamb of God. The other is the church of the devil. Verse 222. Wherefore, whoso belongeth not to the church of the Lamb of God belongeth to the great church, which is the mother of abominations. And she is the whore of all the earth. And it came to pass that I looked and beheld the whore of all the earth. Keep in mind, even though we're not going here, when you look at Revelation and the prophecies there, what does it show? It shows a married woman about to have a child. It shows the whore of all the earth. It shows a dragon. These symbols help explain what that is too, okay? But this, coming back to Nephi, so she sat on many waters, the whore of all the earth. Verse 25, she had dominion over all the earth among all nations, kindreds, tongues, and people. And it came to pass that I beheld the church of the Lamb of God. Now, I don't, as there's reason to do it, scripture gives us reason where we want to pick a single denomination to say, oh, that's the whore. It could have its roots in something like that, but it's bigger. It's bigger than this. It's, it's more... This isn't just, you know, an entity of a church. This is a political, spiritual, everything overwhelming movement to work against everything good of God that is still coming. So she has dominion over the nations, kindreds, tongues, and people. I mean, this is culture. This is ideas. This is everything fighting against good. So verse 226 And it came to pass that I beheld the church of the Lamb of God. Its numbers were few because of the wickedness and the abominations of the whore which sat on many waters. Nevertheless, I beheld that the church of the Lamb of God, which were the saints of God, were also upon the face of the earth. And their dominion upon the face of the earth was small because of the wickedness of the great whore which I saw. So he sees a time and he's not describing just... Notice, this isn't just, oh, I found saints gathered in Jackson County, right? He's saying on every nation, he's got good people. Now, where those people are, who they come from, where the roots are, we don't know. The scripture doesn't say that. But the point is, if they are the church of God, we know their hearts have been changed. They've been baptized by the Holy Spirit. They made a covenant with Jesus. They believe him to the understanding that they're given. Okay. I, I think we have to agree with that's how it's describing. So, Bad church in every land and a small presence of good church in every land, according to what this says, anyhow. Its numbers were few because of the wickedness of the abominations of the whore. 227, I beheld the church of the Lamb of God, which were the saints of God, were on the face of the earth, all the face of the earth. Their dominion was small because of the wickedness of the whore. And it came to pass that I beheld the great mother of abominations to gather them together in multitudes upon the face of the earth among all the nations of the Gentiles to fight against the Lamb. And it came to pass that I, Nephi, beheld the power of the Lamb of God, that it descended upon the saints of the church of the Lamb and upon the covenant people, which were scattered upon all the face of the earth. Now, notice Notice this. This isn't a power of God descending upon saints in one location. And this is where the paradigm has to change a little bit. He's describing something beautiful where somehow his spirit is reaching people wherever they are in the world in the day to come. And, and I'm not diminishing a gathering in the center place. Don't get me wrong. I'm not. But I'm just saying this is describing something that's yet to happen. I wanted to add to that, you know, since we're talking about Zion, it says in uh, Genesis chapter 7, will sweep the earth like a flood. Well, I, I love it when he says this, and there shall be my abode. Yep. Christ is talking, I'm going to make my abode in Zion. And it shall be a Zion which shall come forth out of all the creations which I have made. And for the space of a thousand years, the earth shall rest. Right. So why did we read Isaiah 11? Because when, the, when Jesus' abode is in Zion, he is doing something powerful. What I'm trying to get you to maybe turn the thinking a little bit is to realize that when Zion comes, it isn't the end of the story. There's a great work that unfolds at this time. And this is describing something. And I, and I want you to see what happens. I, I want to get through verse 237 here because I want you to see how this ends. 
So the power of God descends on the saints who are the covenant people. I'm back at verse 230. They were scattered across the world, but they were armed with righteousness, with the power of God in great glory, says verse 231. And it came to pass that I beheld the wrath of God was poured about upon the great and abominable church, insomuch that there were wars and rumors of wars. Now, where did we read about wars and rumors of wars? That was in Matthew 24. So he's describing a time. He says, hey, you're going to hear about wars and rumors of wars. You're going to hear about this time when I, I, I come back to the earth. Well, what is this time? It's the second time. Now, now notice what happens. He says, the wrath of God, this is verse 234, the wrath of God is upon the mother of harlots. And behold, you're seeing these things, Nephi, when the day comes that the wrath of God is poured out upon the mother of harlots, which is the great and abominable church of all the earth, whose founder is the devil. Then, drum roll, please. Before I read it, have we seen the wrath of God poured out on the great and abominable church yet? Yes or no? I would say no. I would say no. So that means it's got to be something to come. So what does verse 237 say? And this is probably where we'll conclude at least this part of this. Notice everything is summarized now in this verse. I can't emphasize it enough. Then at that day, when God's people scattered upon the face of the earth have his power upon them, even though they're outnumbered by the wickedness around them, he says, at they, they, that day, the work of the Father shall commence in preparing the way for the fulfilling of his covenants, which he made to his people, which are of the house of Israel. Where did we read about all the commencing? That's 3 Nephi 10. Remember 3 Nephi 10? He, said, he says to the remnant, he said, when you build a city here, when the gospel returns to you, house of Joseph, he said, in that day, the work will commence when the gospel is preached among the remnant. He said, and notice he says, and I will be in your midst. The powers of heaven will come down in that day when the work commences. So it goes forth to the Jews eventually. So we're going to pick this up again here next week. I realize our, our time is, is over. But we're going to try to tie in everything that Matthew 24 is saying with all these other scriptures we've been saying and hopefully get a clear picture of what God's going to do. Thank you, guys. Don't turn it off.